The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening. Welcome to Bronx Talk. Tonight, we're going to talk about something that you have heard a lot about, but maybe don't know a lot about. And that is the fact that the state legislature agreed with the governor on a $220 billion budget. And uh, there are a lot of interesting items in there, but a lot of people in the Bronx are saying, well, wait a minute, that's all out there. I don't know how it will affect me. We brought in two of our elected officials this evening to go through it and find out exactly what does the just signed $220 and $20 billion budget mean for our home borough of the Bronx. So uh, let's say a good evening to our uh, two elected officials from the North Bronx uh, and the 81st Assembly District. It's Assemblyman Jeff Dinowitz. Nice to have you with us, sir. Good to be here. And uh, from the 84th Assembly District, much further south, uh, it is Amanda Septimo, Assemblymember Septimo. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Gary. Assemblymember Dinowitz was quoted and also told me personally that he said it was the best budget in his 28 years of office. So let's start there. Why do you think so? And then we'll find out in her couple of years uh, of service whether uh, Amanda Septimo agrees. Um, Assemblyman, what do you think? Why, why is it the best budget you ever saw? Well, first, let me start by saying that even the best budget has parts of it that I don't like. Uh, you know, it's almost like I have to hold my nose sometimes to vote for some of these bills. We vote on 10 budget bills, but the big bill is uh, called the Alpha Bill, had most of the stuff in it. And and there were some bad things I didn't like, like that, that football stadium. I was totally against that. But the fact is we're doing more good things than we've ever done before. We've added huge amounts of money to education, to foundation aid. We've added money for health care, uh, for child care, uh, for a, a whole array of subjects, for city university, for state university. I'm just looking at a laundry list here. We've literally done more than we ever have for more people. And while we didn't do everything we wanted to do, uh, there were always more things we need to do. The fact is we accomplish more than we ever have before. So even with some of the things that I didn't like in the budget, the good far outweighed the bad. And and anybody who voted against this because they didn't you know, like a football stadium, they also voted against school funding, they voted against childcare and things like that. I was very pleased and proud to vote in favor of, of the budget bills. Do you think, uh, first of all, I do want to um, uh, define for the general public the alpha bill so people know what it is. It's very important because this stuff comes out there and then nobody knows what it is, is the Education, Labor and Family Assistance Bill. It was called uh, the big ugly this year. And uh, so a lot of people uh, were uh, concerned about it. Do you think, Assemblyman, um, that this happened because you have three Democrats um, running, uh, you know, the the, the governorship as well as the two legislative bodies uh, so that they, it was much easier to come to agreement. Uh, and so for you as being a staunch Democrat for many years, you say, well, wait a minute, got what I like uh, because we had that kind of unanimity. I, I think that helped. The fact that we got so much aid from the federal government helped. The fact that uh, tax collections were up and, and that the economy is booming. I mean, people might think, oh, inflation, things are bad and the inflation is bad, but the economy is booming. Unemployment is going down. Tax collections are going up. So we had more uh, that we could use to do the things that we want to do. Uh, I, I think the bad part was at the end, the governor uh, put policy things in the budget, some of which many of us disagreed with. But in order to pass a budget, it has to be a three-way deal and no one gets everything they want. So the assembly, the Senate, the governor, those are the three parties involved. 
And in order to make the deal, everybody had to agree. So, you know, the governor wanted her stadium, and I understand that. She's from Buffalo. So she got that, and we got the things that we wanted in large part, which is to help people, especially uh, uh, lower-income people. We did that. We didn't do quite as much as we want, but we went much further than we ever have before, and that's really terrific, I think. I think it used to be called the three men in the room, and now, of course, it's two women in the room, and um, I guess that is appropriate then to bring in Amanda Septimo. So are you as enthusiastic as uh, the Assemblyman is? Uh, You know, Gary, I think I certainly agree with my colleague in that there is a lot of progress made in this budget um, related to things that are really important to communities uh, like the South Bronx. Uh, But I've got to be honest with you, I'm not as enthusiastic. I think for all of the great things that were included, there were many places where the budget fell short in terms of serving our communities. um, And budgets are ultimately a statement of values. How you spend your money matters. And it speaks to what you think is important as a community and as a society. And I think that there were quite a few places where I think I wish that we had decided to spend money differently as Democrats. Well, you you know that I'm going to ask you to define what some of those things are. Um, uh, you know, can we start and just say, well, the the Buffalo Bills stadium, especially what we've been through with the Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, uh, that that really is a larger issue than something you wanted to just look past. Exactly right. Um, the Buffalo Bill Stadium is one example of how we're taking state dollars and putting them into private hands um, and really building private franchises, which, you know, you can make an economic development argument, but every economist um, from the left side of the political spectrum to the right agrees that stadiums are not good economic development projects. So I would have loved to see that same money still go to Buffalo, but really be committed to growing their economy in a way that's meaningful for the people who live there. Um, But additionally, you know, I think that there's important details in some of the programs that we passed. So for example, um, access to universal childcare, $3 billion to make sure that working parents have somewhere to to put their kids so where they can have peace of mind. The decision to cut undocumented children out of access to that program is deeply problematic from my perspective. Again, when you're thinking about communities like the South Bronx, these are major issues that are going to impact people. So you can have great programs, but if the implementation is faulty, then how good is your program? Uh, Is there a point, I mean, the assemblyman was talking about, um, uh, you know, a a negotiation, give, you know, let's say the governor what she wants, so you get what you want. Um, You are not willing to do that sort of compromise at this point, sounds like. Well, I'm not not certainly suggesting it's wrong. I just want to define it. That's all. Well, the budget is passed. uh, And that was that was a sort of provision that the governor's office was pushing for and ultimately made it through. And so we're we're going to have to contend with the reality that undocumented children will not have access to universal child care programs and that that's going to impact their parents, which are who are our friends, our neighbors, our community members um, and And your constituents as well. Exactly. Um, I, I want to ask you both, and, and we'll we'll you know break down some of the other things. I want to ask you both about the process. And I did mention the old three men in the room. Of course, now the governor is a woman, and the, uh, uh, the Senate uh, leader is a, a female as well. Um, but, and I couldn't tell just from reading reports whether it was just media complaining about how secretive the budget was or whether um, you folks felt uh, kept out of the process. Uh, Let's see, uh, Brian Horner, Blair Horner, excuse me, from my perg, said this has been among the most secretive budgets I've ever seen, where they did the barest minimum to let the public know what's going on. Um, And and there you can see the quote. So um, what what do you think? Let's start with you, um, Assemblymember Septimo. Uh, Was it secretive? Uh, Was it a case of three people in a room cutting a budget and then letting you know about it? Or did you feel like you had sufficient input? Well, I'll tell you, I think the speaker, our, our leadership in the assembly does a really good job in working to make sure that we're being brought into discussion and are aware of what's being discussed and what's being negotiated as they sort of negotiate on our behalf. Um, I will say that there were what felt like many 11th hour surprises from the administration that ultimately made the budget, settling the budget difficult and led to our very untimely budget um, being uh, nearly two weeks late. And so I, I, 
think our, our leadership in our house did a, as best as they could to keep us abreast, um, but you just can't anticipate 11th hour surprises from the administration, and we got more than a few from the governor this round. Uh, Assemblyman, your thoughts? And now you've been through a couple of speakers. She just talked about Carl Hasty being a, a little more transparent, maybe, than and you were, of course, served <laughs> under Shelley Silver. Um, do, you, do you feel like um, you, you were included well? Now, you, of course, have a little more seniority. Let's be, let's be clear about that. Um, but what are your thoughts about the transparency of the process? I, I don't think it was the least transparent budget. I, I think almost by its nature, you know, we, we have a speaker to represent us in the negotiations. There are 107 of us in the assembly majority. We can't all be in the room at the same time, but we spend hours and hours and hours conferencing amongst ourselves uh, to discuss uh, what we want in the budget, everybody's voice can be heard, and then based upon that, the speaker, you know, goes in to do the negotiations. I mean, it's kind of like almost like labor management negotiations. You have to have somebody representing you. Uh, things do happen at the eleventh hour, and beyond that, uh, th this is—I hate to say it—it's kind of the nature of the process. And uh, whether it's three men or three women or some combination thereof, <laughs> I don't think that's the important thing. Uh, that's not what determines this. This budget was late, just like other budgets were late in the past. But uh, I, I will say, and, and I, am a, uh, I am a fan of the governor, but I do think she put things, some things on the table very late in the process that really made it much harder to do this, and I think the Buffalo Bill Stadium is the is the biggest example of that. I, I mean, on the floor of the assembly, I, I I said what I thought of that stadium. I think it's a huge mistake spending so much money on something like that when there are other priorities that are much much higher. But uh, again, it's it's a give and take process, and not everything is done. Uh, you know, on on TV when it comes to the budget negotiations. So we got a lot of what we want, but we have a lot more to do. Uh, my colleague is absolutely correct in terms of the child care. We need to do more, but we've gone much farther than we have in the past in terms of what we are doing. And it was it was a big victory in that sense. I, I'd like to think also, that since Carl Hasty is a Bronxite and um, has served here, that um, both of you would feel more comfortable uh, approaching him. Now, I don't know how he deals with people in other locales, but it certainly doesn't hurt that he's a Bronx assembly member as well. Um, let's um, start with you, Amanda Septimo, about um, the criminal justice reforms. Um, the, this was a highly controversial concept, and I'm, I'm just going to roll through. Um, the judges now have more discretion. Uh, hate crimes will be subject to arrest, not desk, desk appearance tickets. And for repeat offenders, judges uh, will be allowed to set bail, even if the crime would not be uh, what is known as currently bail eligible. Um, judges um, can set bail in felony cases involving illegal guns, including when illegal guns are, are sold or given to minors. Um, what, do, what do you think about that? Was that a good um, movement for um, the state to say, well, you know, there's been a lot of talk about bail reform and maybe they went too far with the original bill and this was a way of um, moving back? What are your thoughts? And then, of course, Assemblyman Dinowitz will weigh in as well. So ultimately, um, first, I, I think this process was horrendous. I don't think that we should be legislating something that is so critically important in such a sort of condensed timeline. And I think this was another one of those examples of kind of an 11th hour addition to the budget cycle that really complicated matters. Um, so I think we're, we were already starting from a position of weakness in terms of not being able to think thoughtfully and critically about the policies that we would be ultimately putting forth. Um, and I think, you know, some of those changes, the ones related to firearms um, in felony cases, et cetera, minors with guns, all of those changes I think follow and hopefully will help us reduce this sort of epidemic of gun violence that we've seen happening and make people feel more comfortable and safer in their communities. Uh, but when I hear about desk appearance tickets, um, you know, I think we, as it relates to hate crimes, I think that's fair and appropriate. But when you're talking about making crimes that were not bail eligible, suddenly bail el eligible because of two desk appearance tickets, the reality is that sounds like someone who's committing crimes over and over and over. But the reality is that in practice, when you give judges this discretion, it means that it could be a mom who stole diapers for her baby one day and then five days later stole formula. Um, and of course, you want to hope that that's never anyone's reality. But we know that poverty is a major issue in our community. And so I am... Uh, 
cautious about giving judges more discretion. And I think it'll be very interesting to see how they yield that discretion because they hadn't really been using it um, to the full extent when the bail reform laws were passed originally. And so it'll. I hope that this discretion is now used to build safer communities and not continue to harm them through upper incarceration. What you just said reminds me of two things um, that I've thought about. Um, number one, you know, you described, you know, the horrible situation that a mom is stealing, you know, diapers or something, which is, you know, you don't want anybody to be in that circumstance. These are the kind, I, and I'm just going to make my own little editorial point. These are the kinds of things that go on in the Bronx that the world doesn't know about. And and it, it's very difficult, certainly, to communicate that to people who live upstate and maybe in different circumstances or in the suburbs or whatever, Long Island, um, that they, they say, well, wait a minute, we don't want anybody to steal. Certainly nobody's forgiving that. But, there, but you know, if the, if the legislature or the, the court system can have some understanding that's, um, that's uh, uh, useful. Um, and then the, the, the other aspect of, um, you know, what you're talking about that concerns me um, because, frankly, I thought the idea of giving judges more discretion in some of the more difficult and, and more obvious cases is important. Somebody who's committed nine crimes and then comes in after shooting somebody, boy, I sure would rather that person not be out in, 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 uh, you know, in, in the public. But then that opens the door, potentially, to a judge using old-style racism, if you want, or discrimination to make a judgment about somebody that may not be as fair, which was the original idea behind the original bail reform. And so I just I yeah, want to respond to what you just said about the uh -huh. point about that being a really common story in the South Bronx. I, I don't want to suggest it's common. I just want to suggest that it's it out happened. there and people don't know what's going on. Absolutely. And the law, the changes that we made did account for sort of a poverty consideration. Judges will have the opportunity to examine sort of crimes as they happen right. uh, through the lens of if this is a poverty sort of driven uh, example. But to your point, discretion is a really powerful thing. And I think it'll be really interesting and potentially transformational um, in ways that are both negative and positive um, to see how judges decide to use this discretion. Yeah, we, we certainly wish we hope and wish we could trust our legal system and judges to make the right determination. Assemblyman, uh, this is a difficult um, issue. What do you think? Well, first, I don't think we should have done this in the budget. This is a major uh, policy issue which we should have dealt with independently yeah, think, uh, on its uh, own and should have, when it could have been debated yeah. uh, all by itself instead of being thrown into the budget. By putting it in the budget, the governor has a lot more power in the budget process than after the budget. That's why governors put uh, issues like that in the budget. Uh, I, I supported bail reform at the time we passed it, and I said so on the floor of the assembly again, that the essence of bail was to create a caste system whereby two people who are accused of the same crime, one person who has the means is out on bail and the other person rots away at Rikers. And that's just not fair. That's not right. It means that poor people uh, await trial in Rikers while other people don't. Here's an example. Uh, about a month ago, a woman was accused, a young woman, 20 something, was accused of pushing an 87 year old music teacher on the ground for no apparent reason. And the woman ultimately died of her injuries. Yeah. $500,000 bail was set. But this woman comes from a wealthy family, so she's out. And somebody who uh, wouldn't have the money would be sitting in Rikers Island for who knows how long. It's just not a fair system. Uh, there, were, there were demands for changes because of, of the crime that's going on now. Uh, and what I've told people consistently is it's really interesting how some of the places that have the biggest increases in crime, such as St. Petersburg, Florida or Austin, Texas, are in Republican led states. Do you really think that New York bail reform caused the increase in crime in other states? Or perhaps it's something else besides bail reform that's causing crime to go up, such as, I don't know, maybe COVID. And or may, maybe available guns. I mean, we, we, <laughs> any one of the trafficking of guns. Although we seem to have plenty of guns in New York. The point being that I was I had to defend both bail reform and the uh, the changes that were made. And I'm, I'm fine with generally fine with the changes that we made, because I think the essence of what we did three years ago with bail reform will remain intact. And I firmly believe that as COVID wanes, and hopefully it will, so will the increase 
in crime. And I hope that our mayor uh, does the things he needs to do. But uh, but the other thing is, uh, and Amanda is right, the we're not, it, we specifically take into account crimes of poverty. So when we're talking about somebody stealing a box of diapers or a loaf of bread, that is in a whole different category than somebody who's like committing a crime to, to make money, somebody who's you know stealing watches to sell somewhere. Um, and so we, we did take that into account. We do not want to penalize people because they're poor. That's wrong. Uh, both of you have uh, responded to this question, suggesting what uh, my next um, uh, question is, and that is about 421A, uh, the fact that that was not included in the budget. So uh, let's talk about 421A. Um, you can define, uh, Assemblymember Dinowitz, what it is, if you'd like, and then um, we'll let Assemblymember Septimo weigh in as well. Um, and then let's talk about all the housing. I know, Assemblyman, you've been involved in the um, uh, ERAP and LRAP programs. Um, so let's start with 421A, and you can talk about the other housing issues, and then we'll go to Assemblymember Septimo about that. Okay. Well, well, my goal, one of my main goals, probably the main goal for the past two years, is to keep people in their homes. Uh, and I was the author and main sponsor of the eviction moratorium, which probably saved thousands, tens of thousands of people from eviction, from being made homeless during the pandemic. Um, but we, we do many things to try to create more housing. One of them is 421A. I have always been an opponent of 421A. 421A essentially is a tax benefit to developers who build housing and who reserve a, a very small number of apartments for uh, people, for supp supposedly affordable apartments. And the program just doesn't work. I have been 100% against 421A because the city of New York taxpayers are foregoing 1.7 billion dollars a year right now in tax revenue to developers who are getting the 421A handout, and we're not getting our money's worth. If we were getting our money's worth, maybe I would feel differently, but it has not created a, a, enough affordable apartments. It has not created enough apartments that are really affordable for the people who need it the most. So either the program should go away or, the, or we should have a program that really develops housing for people who need it and housing that will remain forever affordable. I think um, uh, we'll, we'll let uh, Amanda Septimo uh, weigh in on the same thing. Uh, to me, um, the first thing has to be negotiated, and then maybe then you say whatever the number is, 25% affordable, 50% affordable. That if you renegotiate that number, maybe it, it becomes worth it. Uh, but that can't happen in the budget. It should happen as it is going to happen uh, during the legislative sessions. Uh, Assembly Member Septimo, what do you think? Uh, I, I agree with everything Jeff said, I think. Um, and this is a program that needs to be thoughtfully thought through. Uh, and there just simply is not enough space in the budget to do that. As we saw with bail reform, when you try to kind of rush through these hugely important uh, programs with widespread impact, you end up with a process that is simply imperfect. And I don't know that we'll ever achieve perfection in the state legislature, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep striving for it. Um, the 421A program uh, for all of its sort of intent, I think, with with regard to building affordable housing, it falls short of the goal. Ultimately, what what it's facilitating is communities changing at a rate that doesn't allow people to, who live there to stay there, um, what we all know as gentrification. And um, I don't think it should be the case that state dollars are contributing to facilitating gentrification in communities. And to simply extend uh, that program would have been a travesty because we know on paper that this is a program that is intended to do this thing. It is not meeting that goal. And so we need to go back to the drawing board and reevaluate. And I'm excited to do that um, as we continue in this legisl legislative session. So I was glad to see it left out of the budget. Well, what about um, LRAP, which is Landlord Rental Assistance Program? Do you equate that with 421A or do you say, no, this is different? And then uh, we'll let the assemblyman weigh in as well. No, so I think it's I think it's uh, very different. Uh, I think one is talking about development. Uh, and so we're talking about folks who are building and who ultimately are looking to kind of pull major profits out of out of projects um, and sort of destabilizing communities potentially in the process. And we've seen that happen over and over across the city. Um, and I think LRAP is about um, people who own property and who had a hard time over the last couple of years, just like we all did and who need help just like we all did. Um, and so I think LRAP is really um, the opposite in its intent of 421A in that, or rather in its function, 
um, from 421A in that LRAP is actually meant to help stabilize communities and make sure that we can all return to normalcy or try to return to normalcy with some set of expectation that we're going to get the help from our government when we need it. Uh, Assemblyman, I want to ask you, and then we'll go back to um, Assemblymember Septimo as well, about a non-budgetary thing. Uh, the uh, lieutenant governor uh, resigned um, in a, um, a corruption uh, accusation. Um, so it, it opens up a whole list of questions. I guess it makes it more difficult for uh, Governor Hochul to you know, run again, not that she's not going to, but it certainly gets in the way. So what are your thoughts about uh, Brian Benjamin uh, no longer um, being the Lieutenant Governor, do you think it hurts uh, the governor badly? I, I believe you are uh, outspoken at it supporting her. And then we'll ask uh, 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 I, Andy Septimo the same thing. I, I haven't formally endorsed in that race yet, but I, I, I support Governor Hochul. Um, I think it's very unfortunate what happened with uh, Brian Benjamin. I'm uh, Given the circumstances, I'm glad that he resigned. Uh, I hope that during the next uh, almost, I think it's 11 weeks till primary, uh, that we can talk about the issues, uh, but this doesn't help Governor Hochul. It's right now, it appears that under the law, he can't even be removed from the ballot unless we change the law. Um, so I think that's really regrettable that it happened. But uh, if, if, he, if he did what he's accused of, and that's terrible, uh, but you know, that, that remains to be seen, but I'm glad that he's no longer the lieutenant governor given the circumstance. That certainly would get in the way of a, a lot of different things. Um, Assembly member uh, Septimo, what do you, what do you think? I, I have to tell you, you know, I'm a talk show host. I'm not an elected official. I'm like, if it's true, what is he thinking? This is so fundamental. I mean, it's just, we've been through this with, I mean, I thought about Guy Valella and many others who, who Pedro Espada, who went down in similar kinds of scandals. How, if you're an elected official, especially lieutenant governor, how could you? Although, though at that time he was a senator. Anyway, that's just me. Go ahead, Assemblymember Septimo. What do you got? Well, you know, Gary, I I won't speculate as to his motives or what happened or how right. it happened. Well, that's my job. <laughs> kind of, yeah, exactly. People go through their things. Um, I agree with uh, my colleague that you know ultimately it was the right decision to step down. Um, we cannot deal with these sorts of scandals that distract from the work at hand because we have incredibly important work to do. Uh, and that also sort of fundamentally uh, rock the public's trust in our institutions, um, which we know is already at an all time low. Uh, and so I'm, I'm grateful to see that he stepped down quickly um, and without fanfare because we need to sort of get back to the people's work. And then I think with regard to elections, um, the governor is going to have to do um, some soul searching, I think, on how she runs her campaign, whether she runs with a running mate at all, uh, because I think wow. um, ultimately, you know, she's also on a mission to prove herself and and establish what her what her administration will stand for. And this is certainly, I think, an unexpected hiccup. And she's probably eager to sort of right the ship. And and I wonder if she has time to do that with a new partner. And maybe that just means setting out on her own. Do Do you anticipate uh, supporting her for uh, re-election? I'm sure. I mean, this. What that's do you a think? good question. Um, well, that's I, my I, job. Come on. Yeah. No, that's that's <laughs> a good question. Um, you know, I'm I'm generally I'm super supportive of Democrats generally, and I think um, I'm getting to know the governor like we all are. All right, boy, that's a pretty good answer there. Anyway, uh, Assemblyman uh, Jeffrey Dinowitz from the 81st Assembly District uh, in the North Bronx, thank you so much for joining us. Amanda Septimo from the 84th Assembly District, uh, thank you uh, so much for joining us. For me, it was informative, and I always say if I learned something, then I'm sure our friends and neighbors in the Bronx learned something, so we thank you both for your uh, input. And you know what's going to happen? It's crazy, but we'll be back next week with more. Who knows what we're going to do? So we'll see you then. Good night.